Income Tax 2023-2024, electing the Section 179 Deduction Overview. Get ready and some coffee so we can recognize the quacks when doing income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found in Publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction, Special Depreciation Deduction, Makers, Listed Property, and More, Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us but but that's okay whatever because our merchandise is is better than their stupid stuff anyways like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line now i'm not saying that subscribing to this channel crunching numbers with us will make you thin fit and healthy or anything however it does seem like it worked for her just saying so you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise so you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Yeah. Looking at the income tax formula, remember in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. Noting the sole proprietorship schedule C rules in to line one income of the formula, the Schedule C itself basically being an income statement, having business income minus business expenses, which you could call business deductions, resulting in, in essence, net business income, the net income rolling in from Schedule C to line one income of the formula, the formula basically representing the calculation behind the Form 1040, this being the first page of the 1040, Schedule C ultimately ultimately rolling into line number eight additional income from schedule one here is the schedule one additional income and adjustments to income part number one the schedule c rolling into line three business income or loss this is the schedule c profit or loss from business having an income statement or p l profit and loss format we're down here on the expenses side of things the area that generally has the most different types of accounts in it we're looking at some of the accounts which are more complex than others such as depreciation which as we saw in prior presentation even if we're using a cash based system we're forced to do an accrual based thing with depreciable property putting the property on the books as an asset as opposed to it expensing it at the point in time that we purchase it there is no asset with the schedule c or there's no balance sheet so where do we put it on a separate schedule depreciation schedule and then we use that to allocate the depreciation over the useful life what methods do we use well we talked about the makers method the most common one and then we have these added accelerated depreciations we're going to be touching on some of these accelerated depreciations now i originally thought that i was going to do this in the reverse order meaning that i would think of the normal maker's depreciation and then adjust it for these kind of weird things like the 179 but we're actually going to start with the 179 kind of the weird thing because it's kind of like you're basically depreciating it up front so let me give a quick recap of this we have property it's property plants and equipment we can't expense it but rather have to put it on the books as an asset which makes sense the tax code borrowing that concept from generally accepted you know accounting principles then we have to use the tax code to apply whatever tax method we're going to use usually that's going to be makers which is a form of double declining balance basically with a half year convention usually which we'll talk about later and that kind of still makes sense from a normal accounting standpoint but then they do something funny according to whatever other rationale they have from lobbyists to they want to stimulate the economy makes politicians popular adding 
upfront deductions like a 179 deduction, which basically means that you're kind of extensing more of it, if not all of it, in the first period if you take this deduction. That's why I think it might make sense to do it first and then take a look at the makers, which is going to be depreciating the stuff that didn't yet get depreciated up front. So this looks kind of funny. If we think about what happened here, we're going to say, okay, I would like to depreciate this piece of property. Let's say I bought a $10,000 forklift again, and I want to depreciate it. But they say, no, you can't, even though you're on a cash-based system, you have to put it on the books as an asset and not expense it in year one. So you're like, okay, I'm going to put it on the books as an asset. But then they say that you get a special upfront depreciation like a 179 possibly, which if you qualify for, means you might be able to deduct most, if not all of it in year one, which leads to the question, why didn't you just let me deduct it on the cash based system in the first place? Why do I need the depreciation schedule? And obviously this is because the tax code gets all messy, right? They did a, an accrual thing that makes sense. And then they tinkered with the tax code because of whatever political reasons they came up with. And that's why we end up with these kind of weird things that are happening. Okay, so you can elect to, so from our standpoint, if I can put it on the books and take the depreciation earlier, that is usually a good thing because we would rather depreciate it sooner rather than later. Although we can think of exceptions to that rule, possibly for example, if we're gonna have a much lower tax bracket this year than the following year. But from a general rule, the more we can deduct up front, the more we would want to. Therefore, if we can qualify for a 179 deduction, we're going to take it generally or some combination of that and the special depreciation if we can. Okay. Uh, you can elect to recover all or part of the cost of certain qualified property up to a limit by deducting it in the year you place the property in service. Well, that's great. Why don't you just let me expense it up front? Well, we already talked about that. This is the section 179 deduction. You can elect the section 179 deduction instead of recovering the cost by taking depreciation deductions. So it basically almost negates this whole accrual thing that they're for forcing us to do in the first place. So caution. Estates and trusts cannot elect the Section 179 deduction. That's a little bit outside of our realm. Estates, when someone passes away, a state and then a trust that could be set up. Useful life. So uh, items, the uh, publications. So you can look at these publications for more information. Publication 537, installment sales. Publication 544, sales and other dispositions of assets. Uh, form and instructions form 4562 depreciation and amortization and form 4797 and related instructions for the sale of business property. All right. Uh, what property qualifies to qualify for the section 179 deduction? Your property must meet all of the following requirements. It must be eligible property. It must be acquired for business use. Obviously, we're not talking about personal stuff. You can't buy a house that you plan on living in and take the 179 deduction because that's personal. Although you can deduct other things like the mortgage interest possibly, which is strange for an income tax system, but that is what it is, right? So, so, but this is different. This is business side. So it must have been acquired by purchase and uh, it must not be property described later under what property does not qualify. So we have specific items that they are restricting directly. Eligible property to qualify for the section 179 deduction. Your property must be one of the following types of depreciable property. Number one, tangible personal property. So it's property we can touch. That's, you know, it's tangible. Two, other tangible property except building and their structural components. So buildings and stuff like that, the real estate component typically is going to have its own rules because it's going to last a substantial time longer most of the time have a longer useful life generally than like equipment for example and might have different methods of depreciation specific to it so once again two other tangible property except building and their structural components used as a an intangible part of manufacturing production or extraction or uh, furnishing transactions, communications, electricity, gas, water, or sewage disposal services, B, a research facility used in connection with any of the activities in A above or 
C, a facility used in connection with any of the activities in A, for the bulk storage of uh, fungible commodities. Okay, so number three, single purpose agricultural livestock or uh, horta horticultural structures. Hopefully I said that right. So you can see chap any, once again, the farming in that whole area often has special rules around it. So if you're a tax preparer, be careful of those special rules. Specialize in those areas might be a place to go. But if you're not familiar with them, you're going to have to either get familiar with them if you take on those clients or don't take on those clients because it might be outside of your scope. So see chapter seven of publication 225 for definitions and information regarding the use uh, requirements that apply to these structures. Number four, storage facilities except buildings and their structural components used in connection with distributing petroleum or any primary product of petroleum. Five, uh, we have off the shelf computer software and six, qualified section 179 real property described below okay tangible personal property tangible personal property is any tangible property that is not real property typically like real estate real property it includes the following property machinery and equipment property contained in or attached to a building other than structural components such as refrigerators grocery store counters uh, office equipment, printing presses, testing equipment, and signs. This actually gets a little bit more confusing than you might think, because if you have a building, as we can see, the building itself uh, typically is, you have to separate the building from the land and then possibly be able to depreciate the building, which is good, but the useful life of depreciation of a building is usually quite long of a period, substantially longer than the depreciation of property, plant, and equipment under a maker's depreciation oftentimes and might only have a straight line depreciation as opposed to the double declining methods that we can use for some of the other equipment. So we would like to then be able to categorize things that might be attached to the building as not part of the building, but rather equipment because then we can depreciate those items at a, a, a faster rate. So like a refrigerator, clearly, we would like to not depreciate it over the life of the building. We would like to depreciate it over the life of the equipment because we're going to get the deduction sooner. More complex things come into play with like an air conditioning system or something like that, which you can argue about, is it part of the building or is it a separate piece of equipment? What's going to be the useful life of, of the sprinkler system or the or the that kind of stuff within a, within a building? So gasoline storage tanks and pumps at retail service stations, livestock, including horses, cattle, hogs, sheep, goats, and mink and other fur bearing animals, uh, portable air conditioners or heaters placed in service by you in tax years beginning after 2015, certain property used predominantly to furnish a lodging or in connection with the furnishing of lodging, except as provided in section 50 B2. So the treatment of property as tangible personal property for section 179 deduction is not uh, controlled by its treatment under the under local law for example property may not be tangible personal property for the deduction even if treated so under local law and some properties such as fixtures may be tangible personal property for the deduction even if treated as real property under a uh, local law so notice, obviously, we get into these problems on the Fed side of things versus the state and local side of things, who has kind of jurisdictions to things such as terminology. And when you're talking about the federal income taxes, then the question is, how do we define this term? Is the federal income tax deferring to something like the state, which sometimes happens, for example, on the personal side with, for example, marriage? is when you think about, should I file married filing joint? Can they qualify for married filing joint or separate and so on? Then it might default to some extent on the state law as to what marriage means with regards to the state, right? A contractual agreement or whatever. Uh, but sometimes you can also imagine that the, the government's gonna say, well, no, I'm not gonna let the state redefine what we mean to be charging federal income taxes by just changing the meaning of the word for that particular locale, in which case the meaning of the words 
for the federal law might change from the state law because they're just because you can imagine people just playing word games, which is quite popular these days. People just change the meaning of the word and then act like they don't know what you're talking about. And, it, and it's kind of frustrating. But off the shelf computer software. So then off the shelf computer software is qualified is qualifying property for the purposes of the section 179 deduction. So when you get into software, it gets a little bit confusing because sometimes you have custom software or you might create custom software and so on, which might be treated differently than off the shelf uh, type of, uh, of software. So this is computer software that is readily available for purchase by the general public, is subject to a non-exclusive license and has not been substantially modified. So it includes any program designed to cause a computer to perform a desired function. However, a database or similar item is not considered computer software unless it is in the public domain and is incidental to the operation of otherwise qualifying software. In other words, a database is things that you would think might be more customized because you might, a database is gonna compile certain data which might be unique to a certain thing. Although many softwares are basically kind of databases like a, like a QuickBooks or something, it's kind of like a database. But anyway, qualifying section 179, a real property. So you can elect to treat certain qualified real property you placed in service during the tax year as section 179 property. If this election is made, the term section 179 property will include any qualified real property that is qualified improvement property as described in section 168E6 of the Internal Revenue Code and any of the following improvements to non-residential real property placed in service after the date the non-residential real property was first placed in service. So you've got the roofs, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning property, fire protection, and alarm systems, security systems. So general rule, if for small businesses, it's usually fairly straightforward if it's a piece of equipment, whether it be a depreciable piece of equipment and how to depreciate it because it's pretty well outlined by the code. Certain areas though, especially when you're dealing with real estate, can get quite complex. Some CPA firms actually specialize in, 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 in finding the, the best depreciation strategy for the building trying to break out, in essence, the building into different components to be able to depreciate certain parts of the building faster than the maximum amount you'd have to depreciate a building over. So again, so you just have to be aware when you're dealing with different clients, who you're dealing with, what your specializations are, what your network's gonna look like when dealing with those different clients and who you wanna take on and who you wanna say, I, I'm not gonna do that because it's outside my scope. Qualified improvement property. Generally, this is any improvement to an interior portion of a building that is non-residential real property if the improvement is placed in service after the date the building was first placed in service. Also, qualified improvement property does not include the cost of any improvement attributable to the following. The enlargement of the building, uh, any elevator or escalator, the internal structure framework of the building, property acquired for business use. So to qualify for section 179 deduction, your property must have been acquired for use in your trade or business. This seems straightforward, but obviously it has to be mentioned. If you bought a house or a private car, that $300,000 car, you're not using it for, for work, it's a personal car, then you can't really deduct it in that case. It'd have to be for business uses. Property you acquire only for the, the production of income, such as investment property, rental property, if renting property is not your trade or business, and property that produces royalties does not qualify. So partial business use. Now, obviously, from a general business perspective, we want to keep our business property separate from our personal property, but we can't always do that because once again, you're gonna say, hey, I need that $300,000 car to cruise down the strand on because that's how I attract all the cool clients that all the clients think I'm cool. And then that makes me money so that I can pay at least the interest off on the $300,000 car that I'm cruising down the, so, so, so then on the house, similar kind of thing. 
So what happens in those instances? So when you use property for both business and non-business purposes, you can elect the Section 179 deduction only if you use the property more than 50% for business in the year you place it in service. We took a little bit of a look at this when we looked at the depreciation before. We might look at it a little bit more later, but note that with, for the example, the automobile we put on the books and said you might be using it partially for business and partially non-business. Well, what can you take the 179 deduction, which is this huge upfront uh, deduction, if you're using it substantially or mostly for personal? Generally, the idea would be no, you have to use it mostly for business. It's mostly business use, then possibly you're allowed to get that 179. So if you use the property more than 50% for business, multiply the cost of the property by the percent of business use. In other words, if you're putting the, like a car on the books and it cost $10,000 and it was 80% business, we take the 10,000 times 80%, that would be the cost that you can then depreciate, which then is the portion that might be able to be subject to 179 an upfront depreciation given the fact that the 80% is higher than the 50% threshold. It's mainly used for business. So use the resulting business cost to figure your section 179 deduction. Example, so May Oak bought and placed in service an item of section 179 property costing $11,000. I may use the property 80% for business, 20% for personal. So that clears the 50% threshold so we should be able to do the 179 thing. The business part of the cost of the property is 8,800, which is 80% of the 11,000. Property acquired by purchase. To qualify for the section 179 deduction, your property must have been acquired by purchase. So you had to purchase the property. This is a little bit different than some other, like you might have the property for, for some other, in some other format than purchasing it and be using it for the business, like transferring it from personal, for example, to business. But here we are a little bit more strict on the requirements to take that upfront deduction. Doesn't mean you can't depreciate it possibly uh, in other circumstances, but we're talking specifically with the 179 deduction here. So for example, property acquired by gift or inheritance does not qualify. This causes an, an issue when you have a gift or inheritance because then the question is what amount should we put the property on the books for because we didn't buy it at that point in time so do we put it on the books at what the fair market value is at this time or possibly at the value at the point uh in time it was purchased by the other person so we assume their basis and so on and so forth which becomes kind of a messy situation which is a little bit outside of our scope here property is not considered acquired by purchase in the following situations. Number one, it is acquired by one component member of a controlled group from another component member of the same group. So again, you've got this kind of related party type of thing, which the assumption would be is not an arm's length transaction, which means the IRS is going to have special rules oftentimes. Two, its basis is determined either A, in whole or in part by its adjusted basis in the hands of the person from whom it was acquired. So in other words, remember you have these special situations like in like if it was a gift or something like that, then it wasn't you didn't buy it at that point. So you, so what are you what are you going to put it on the books for, right? So how do you, how are you going to value it? And you might for example need to to use the basis of the person who bought it, which means it might be less than the current fair market value of of the item. And the reason we do that is because if you have to take on the lower basis, then that would mean that it does have a tax detriment uh, at the point in time that you sell it because a lower basis means that you won't get as much of a depreciation expense over time if you get to depreciate it and or when you sell it, then you're going to have a higher gain at the point in sale or a, a less of a loss. So B, under the stepped up basis rules for property acquired from a decedent. So in other words, a step up basis would have a similar situation. You didn't buy it. Now you inherited it. And then again, the question is, do you take on the basis that you had from the person who died when they bought it? Or possibly you step up the basis, 
which would be a benefit typically using the fair market value maybe if it's higher than the basis at the point of the time that the person uh, died. Uh, okay, so three, it is acquired from a related person. So similar related person issue. Related person, what is that? We'll go over this fairly quickly. We discussed it a bit later uh, before in prior presentations with this related person issue. Obviously related persons are a problem because you don't have an arm's length market transaction oftentimes. Related persons are described under related persons earlier. However, to determine whether a property qualifies for section 179 deduction, treat as an individual's Pam family, only their spouse, uh, ancestors and lineal descendants and substitute 50% for 10% uh, uh, each place it appears. Example, so you are a tailor. You bought two, that's nice, a, a tailor. I've never been a tailor, bro. You bought two industrial uh, sewing machines from your father. You placed both machines in service in the same year you bought them. So they do not qualify as section 179 property because you and your father are related persons. Yep, they was, sure are. We, you cannot claim a section 179 deduction for the cost of these machines. What property does not qualify? Land and improvements uh, accepted property. So land and improvements. So land, uh, land and land improvements do not qualify as section 179 property. Land improvements include swimming pools, paved parking areas, uh, wharf, wharves, docks, bridges, and fences. Accepted property, even if the requirement explained earlier under what property qualifies are met, uh, you cannot elect the section 179 deduction for the following property. So certain property you lease to others if you are a non-corporate lessor, property used predominantly outside the United States except property described in section 168G4 of the Internal Revenue Code, property used by certain tax-exempt organizations except property used in connection with the production of income subject to the tax on unrelated trade or business income, property used by government units or foreign persons or entities, except property used under a lease with a term of lease of less than six months. And leased property, generally you cannot claim a section 179 deduction based on the cost of property you lease to someone else. This rule does not apply to corporations. However, you can claim a 179 deduction for the cost of the following property. One, property you manufacture or produce and lease to others. Two, property you purchase and lease to others if both the following tests are met. A, the term of the lease, including options to renew, is less than 50% of the property's class life. B, for the first 12 months after the property is transferred to the leasee, the total business deductions you are allowed on the property other than rents and reimbursed amounts are more than 15% of the rental income from the property. 